This video was made possible by our generous supporters on Patreon. Welcome to our family, Francois. Visit our Patreon page and vote for our next video. There's an old saying that seems to have been around forever. They just don't make them like they used to. Odds are, if you've ever had a conversation with an older person about any subject, especially relating to film, the conversation will get to the point of them asking, why don't they make good movies anymore? And judging by the way people say this, it would seem that common sense clearly indicates that any good films that come out nowadays are simply outliers, exceptions to the standards set by the terrible movies of our era. It's a common assumption that Hollywood is filled with memories of former glory, black and white gems, the bold spaghetti westerns of the 60s, or the exciting adventure films of the 80s. Truth be told, everyone has their own preferred golden age of cinema, where 9 out of 10 films that came out were nothing short of a masterpiece. Or at least, that's the perception. While it can't be denied that Hollywood in 2018 is mostly owned by corporations who only want to make reboots, sequels, and comic book movies for maximum profit, some of the films aren't too bad. Some of them are actually pretty good and are worth checking out. There are a ton of bad movies that come out each year, for sure. But if you take a close look, Hollywood has been taking out the garbage since the 1930s. The oldest notable example is Reefer Madness a propaganda piece aimed at tricking the public into thinking marijuana use would be the cause for manslaughter, suicide, attempted rape, and an uncontrollable descent into madness. What has definitely changed over time is the number of movies that are released every year, and this is a big contributor to the rationale behind people's bias for older films. According to Box Office Mojo, the number of feature-length films released per year has been steadily increasing, with some minor fluctuations, from 510 in 1988 to 730 in 2018. Also, if you check out the Wikipedia article titled List of Films Considered the Worst, which includes movies cited by many different critics as being the worst films ever made, you'll see that the number of films has increased pretty much every decade. So, the point is that if the number of movies that are released each year has steadily increased, so has the probability of watching a bad film. In purely technical terms, this isn't really a false accusation. The vast majority of movies today are shot, presented, and distributed digitally, whereas the film projector played a huge role in the movie-going experience of the past. It's not uncommon, especially among cinephiles, to hear that going to a theater and listen to the film projector thumping in the back while looking at the projected image with the classic scratches and grain was an essential part of the film viewing experience. And don't forget the charming cue marks in the upper right hand corner of the screen. In the industry we call them cigarette burns. But were these things as important as many old school lovers of film claim they were? Personally, I've been a defender of these things in the past, so I know where people are coming from when they say that film is both the way to shoot a movie, but also the only proper way to distribute and present it. But come to think about it, film projectors have their own problems. They are loud and can very well be distracting from purely experiencing the film one is trying to watch. Most of our viewers are part of the generation that have had access to both technologies, film and digital. But what will the generations of the future say about this phenomenon? If, for example, we expose people in their early 20s in the year 2050 to a movie in a theater that uses a film projector, they probably won't think too fondly of the technology of the past, perhaps admiring only the engineering of tricking the mind into seeing a moving image in the same way we can admire the first generation of video game consoles. The charm of these older film traits are quickly becoming a thing of antiquity. While there's certainly enjoyment in getting to see a master filmmaker like Quentin Tarantino present The Hateful Eight in a roadshow release in 70mm film, the reality is that this is mostly of interest to intense film purists like Tarantino himself. There will be 70 millimeter film prints out there in the world, screening for people who care. The Hateful Eight was in pretty much every sense a blast to the past. 
a slow-burning western that was shot in Ultra Panavision 70 film stocks with anamorphic lenses, which created a highly widescreen image reminiscent of the epics of the past, such as Ben-Hur and Lawrence of Arabia. But if we never made the switch to digital media, we wouldn't have the commodities of today like Netflix and you certainly wouldn't be able to watch any film you ever wanted in the palm of your hand from the comfort of your own couch. For most, these changes inspire enthusiasm for the future of movies and shows from the perspective of distribution and enjoyment. However, as mentioned before, not everyone shares the same enthusiasm for digital media including directors Quentin Tarantino and Christopher Nolan, who among others have decided to stay with film. You're starting to see pictures, ain't you? Legendary film critic Roger Ebert also expressed his distaste in the emergence of digital media in his 2011 essay titled The Sudden Death of Film. I persisted in preferring the look, the feel, the vibe of celluloid. I insisted, like many other critics, that I always knew when I was not being shown a true celluloid print. The day came when I didn't. The celluloid dream may live on in my hopes, but digital commands the field. My war is over, my side lost, and it's important to consider this in the real world. Ebert's concerns were not only about the rise of films being shot digitally, but also about the emergence of home media entertainment. A concern that is understandable. Less people are going to the movies than ever before, especially in countries like the United States where movie theater prices have skyrocketed, while streaming services such as Netflix become more and more convenient. Of course, nothing has come along that has been able to replace the sheer emotion of experiencing a film with a respectful audience in a proper theater. If you get the chance to watch a good film, you can actually feel the energy, a collective feeling taking over everyone sitting around you. This is something that hasn't been accomplished by home entertainment, at least, not yet. Ebert finishes his essay fondly remembering the days of the typewriter, another technology that has become something for purists as well. What are you looking at? The point here is that it hurts when something we love dies. Regardless of how cheaper, efficient, and overall more accessible a new technology turns out to be. It's only natural, then, that we compare things to how they used to be. This is the profound effect of nostalgia. It affects everything in our lives, from picking out new clothes to deciding which song to play next. It's particularly present in the cinematic experience, as well. We are naturally attached to things, but most of all, to our feelings. With the world changing as fast as it is, it's only natural that we experience a longing for how things used to be. This is something particularly present in the Hollywood that we have today. We briefly talked about this a while back in one of our first video essays titled It, How to Make a Modern Horror Movie. But that video sucks, don't watch it. It's also been the main focus of a great video by Now You See It, titled Explaining the 80s Movie Craze explaining why filmmakers have turned to retro-oriented storylines. This is today's obvious example, but nostalgia is certainly not a recent event. As far back in history as we can look, there have been instances of nostalgia everywhere. The first appearance in literature likely dates back to ancient Greece, where Odysseus, the hero in Homer's epic poem The Odyssey, longs for his faithful wife Penelope even in the face of possible immortality in the hands of the beautiful sea nymph Calypso. Full well I acknowledge, prudent Penelope cannot compare with your stature or beauty, for she is only immortal, and you are immortal and ageless. Nevertheless, it is she whom I daily desire and pine for, therefore I long for my home and to see the day of returning. Nostalgia was considered for centuries an often debilitating and sometimes even fatal medical condition, to even a cause for depression during the mid-20th century. It wasn't until the last half of the past century that we started equating nostalgia to comforting feelings such as joy and the reassuring warmth of childhood. There is undoubtedly a bias toward the familiar, toward the experiences and memories of a better time, or at least that's what our own subjective nostalgic perception tells us. Ideally, we should be able to look at any film through an objective lens. Unfortunately, some of our childhood gems aren't nearly as good as we remembered. 
Some are even terrible, but nostalgia can be one hell of a drug. Merry Christmas, you filthy animal. You got the doll, right? Now we find ourselves in December, which could very well be unofficially called the month of nostalgia. Christmas, the self-proclaimed most wonderful time of the year, is almost here, meaning gifts, Christmas trees, but most importantly binge-watching our favorite Christmas movies of all time. For many of us, Christmas is by far the most nostalgic time of the year. It's the perfect time to remind us of the stories that shaped us from a young age. Studies have shown that cold weather often present in the winter is linked to feelings of loneliness, which is one of the main triggers for nostalgia. At the same time, nostalgia is associated with perceptions of social support, thus counteracting the effect of loneliness. One of the most positive side effects of nostalgia is reminding us that life wasn't always so difficult and that we can survive difficult times because so far, we've been able to survive every single one of them. These stories can temporarily take us back to the past, and for many of us that lived a happy childhood, they allow us to go back to a place in a time of comfort in our lives, where we could rely on our parents and didn't have as many responsibilities as we do today. Nostalgia is also often used as a marketing tool. Some have said it's a crass attempt by the network to market nostalgia. Its drastic effect on the movie industry is clear. Audiences readily respond to things they recognize, especially if they recognize them from a long time ago. You were nicer as a kid. The Once Upon a Deadpool trailer featuring Fred Savage in a room identical to the one from Princess Bride is a great example of how nostalgia can be used to pull viewers into a movie theater. As we grow up, our experiences define the rest of our lives, maybe more than the experiences we have when we're older. It's only natural that we like to relive those defining experiences of the past that remind us of the events that shaped our youth. Relating our past to positive feelings, we may feel a sense of continuity and meaning in our own lives. There is one big obvious downside to nostalgia, and that is that if we're convinced that the best parts of our lives are something of the past, then motivation to take action in the present may be stalled. This is what happens with people that refuse to go to a movie theater because movies just aren't the same anymore, because actors can't hold a candle to the stars of the past, etc. Now, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't respect and love the films that have proven themselves over the years to be staples of the art form. We'll always have Jimmy Stewart, Cary Grant, and Humphrey Bogart there to win our hearts with their magnificent performances. But there is just no use in saying that today's actors aren't made the way they used to. Of course they aren't. The world changes, society changes, and every aspect of film, or art for that matter, adapts to it. Here's a reality check for you. Today is the best time to be a lover of film. There has never been a time in history where the entire library of films, whether it's undying classics, 80s blockbusters, or the superhero movies of our era have been so easily accessible. Don't know where to start? No problem. Just type the greatest movies of all time on Google, and you'll get thousands of lists that you can choose from. Streaming services and Blu-rays provide much better picture and audio quality than we've ever had access to. The world changes. It changes fast. Especially in today's internet-driven world. We can decide to change with it, or we can be left behind. It's up to us. The birth of digital media may have represented the decline and eventual death of film, as Roger Ebert so eloquently put it. But so did the birth of talkies represent the death of the silent era, something that was certainly criticized in the early days of cinema. You don't hear people complaining that movies have sound, do you? Hey everyone, hope you enjoyed the video, and we just want to let you know that A Matter of Film is officially a year old. We uploaded our first video on December 8, 2017. We've learned a lot, and we just want to say thank you for the support, whether you've been around since then or you're new to the channel. Thank you for following us and enjoying the content we put out, which is what it's all about. If you guys are happy, we're happy.
Special thanks to our awesome supporters on Patreon, we really wouldn't be able to dedicate the time and energy to the channel without you guys. Speaking of which, we are extremely close to reaching our goal and when we do, we'll do a Mr. Robot video, so if you'd like to see that, consider joining our Patreon community. Make 2019 the best year yet. Till next time.